Hi everyone. Thank you for thank you so much for coming today. We have John Chen as our guest speaker and I just wanted to go around and have everyone introduce yourselves, tell us where you're from and what you do in events. Let's start with John. With me? Yeah. I I'd like to go last. Is that okay, Lynn? Oh, yes. Sorry. I'm a space cadet today. Um, Eva. Hi, Eva. She might be in the car. Ming Wei. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ming Wei, uh, Ming Wei Gu. I'm based in the New York uh, Queens slash Flushing area in the tri state area. Um, I, uh, what are you doing background? I'm Chinese American. Um, and uh, I run Quickstaff Software, uh, which is scheduling software for uh, event businesses, especially staff scheduling. So getting people to go to the right places at the right times and their calendars and all that and all that jazz. Um, yeah, and uh, recent, you know, recently started coming to these things. So uh, nice to meet everyone. Thanks, Ming Wei. Kristen? Hi, I'm Kristen. I'm based out of Arizona and I work for Epic Party Team. We do rentals all over the valley. Um, we also travel to California, Las Vegas, um, sometimes to the East Coast if it makes sense of like, the event that we're doing. Um, and I am Pacific Islander in white. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. Leslie? Hi, Leslie Robinson. I am a benefit auctioneer with Fun Auctions out of, uh, well, Texas. I, Austin, Texas. I think I already said that. Um, and yeah, that's what I do. My great grandparents were Filipino and immigrated to Hawaii when they were younger. And yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks so much for joining us. Michelle? Hi, I'm Michelle Dunnick. I am, uh, I live in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, and I'm a nonprofit planner for United Way of Southeast Louisiana. And um, I'm also your NACE national president elect. Woo. And I'm Korean. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Elena? Hi everyone, I'm Elena Dong. Um, I'm a event planner. We do weddings, cover events, social events. We I'm based out of Boston with Lean Together. Uh, we also travel to New York, California, Florida for events. Awesome. Thanks, Elena. Anne? We can't forget Anne. Oh. You're on mute. I love your son. Be good. I was hiding there. Um, so I am Ann Harper. I work for NACE National um, and I support the AAPI caucus, obviously not Asian, um, but I love supporting this group and all the energy. It's so fun. So let me know if you need anything NACE related. And can you Thanks. do me a favor to you? Can you co-host me? Uh, yes. What do you need? So you just go to a participants list. Oh, yes. You want to be. Yes, 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 yes. Do all the things. Yes, I know how to do that. I am Lynn, and I'm from Boston. I'm the immediate past president. I am Taiwanese American, and Joanne Grant, who's from Texas, and I, we co chair this group. We love seeing all of you and just talking about our journey, our heritage. Um, I usually give everyone a task. I kind of gave it late. I'm so sorry. But our task was to kind of find out, find the AAPI book or movie to read or watch. And I admittedly like just did it like five minutes ago. <laughs> um, but I want to read, um, I think it's called Crying in, Crying in H Mart is the name of the book. And someone told me a while ago that I looked like the singer from Japanese Breakfast. Um, She's obviously Asian and she actually wrote the book and it's about how her mother died of cancer and just her culture and everything. So 
I'm excited to read it and I'm hoping to read more AAPI books. Someone should read it with me. <laughs> and then last but not least, we have John Chen here as our guest speaker and everybody get ready for a great, great Zoom. Excellent. Thank you, Lynn. Let's see. Wait, what do I have here? I have Cheryl with us. So you asked for book or movie, and I'm excited that I got asked to produce an interview with uh, Julia Atsuka. She wrote a book called The Swimmers. So for anybody who swims laps or has any pool culture, uh, she wrote this book and it hit the uh, Seattle Public Li Library's Goodreads list. And uh, I got uh, access to this interview. So if you want to hear from one of our great Japanese authors, we love to do that. So I'm going to do a little intro to myself, and then uh, we want to go through a couple questions and topics and discussion uh, all around Asian Pacific Islander. And I'd like to share a little bit more about, too, what I'm doing uh, on the Asian Pacific Islander side uh, here in the event industry. So here, let me do a, a quick intro here for myself. OK, so I'm the author of a book called Engaging Virtual Meetings. Now, how did I get here? Well, let me just share a little bit of like how I got here. This is basically my last three years in three minutes. Uh, I got here by doing team building. Does anybody know what geocaching is? If you know what geocaching is, unmute. Michelle doesn't. Ming doesn't. Elena doesn't? Oh my gosh, we got strikeout? OK, that's fine. So geocaching is a high-tech scavenger hunt, uh, what some people affectionately have called using billions of dollars of satellites to find Tupperware. Uh, we turned it into a team and leadership event. So I used to travel around the world and did 140 events a year teaching uh, teams and uh, leaders around the world, including Barcelona, Taiwan, Shanghai, and France. Then, of course, this little thing came around and, and screwed up the world. I think you know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so it screwed up the world. This is what my March of 2020 looked like. Uh, so, yes, I'm a small business too. So, uh, 15 canceled events in March of 2020. You know, it's kind of weird to go back and think like the world is almost normal again. And, uh, and that, I don't know if you go back and remember what it was like for your March of 2020. If you're remotely related, uh, related to the events experience, you probably had something. Ming, I saw you shaking your head. What, what happened to you in March of 2020? In March of 2020, uh, it was it was just a sympathetic. Uh, oh no, um, I was not in the event industry in March 2020. I was still very much in the tech industry, and just everyone's working from home. That's but it uh, didn't affect me nearly as much as y'all. So, well, you can uh, consider yourself lucky. Uh, the software side, my friends at Microsoft. I used, by the way, I used to work at Microsoft for 10 years. I shipped 10 products, got two US patents while I was there. Uh, anyways, when faced with uncertainty, Ming, uh, one of the things that I do, one of my strategies is to look at the past. Okay, so let's see how many uh, OG tech people do we have. Uh, if you don't know what geocaching is, you probably don't know what this is. Anybody know what Prodigy is? Oh my God, Lynn knows. Lynn, tell me what Prodigy is. Wait, make, remember to unmute. It was like when Friendster was around. It was like the, a new net, like browser, or it was like AOL kind of thing. It's it like was where you search for things. It was pre AOL, and why it was famous, it was the first graphical based meeting space online at a time when modems used to make noise, Lynn. All right, so anyways, I'm, I'm saying I was on it and it was 35 years ago that I was on this thing. So the other part too is uh, in 2011, I wrote this book, it's called 50 Digital Team Building Games. And so for decades, I've been trying to tell people, we can do this, we can actually do meaningful work online that we could, uh, that we could save all the travel and expenses and that we could have dinner with our families at the end of the day. But people before March 2020 said, that's a great idea, John but uh, here's a bunch of money and you need to fly to Orlando, All right? So anyways, I'm sitting in my office in March of 2020. I don't make vaccines, but I do know how to make your virtual meeting better. And so I created a class on Eventbrite called Virtual Team Building. And uh, I put it out there and then my intuition said, give it away for free, right? Let's just try and do something to help people at a time when there's so much chaos and uncertainty. And in the end, 5,000 people took the class by the end of 2020. 
my publisher came back and they said, hey, John, do you want to write your second book? I said, sure. And what I feel like is the cruelest joke that my publisher played on me. They said, hey, John, we don't know how long this coronavirus thing is going to last. So will you rush the book? Right? Side note, uh, uh, Lynn and I were talking about coronavirus. One of my friend's family, all four of them went to Alaska last week, and they all, got, they all returned home with coronavirus. Right? So it's not over yet despite what everyone says. And I wrote this book in nine weeks, 60,000 words. Yeah, thanks, Elena. And it came out in October 2020, hit the number one Amazon hot new release. And now I spend the majority of my time having people invest in me to design, produce, speak at, and MC at virtual meetings. Now, I want to thank Lynn and some of the other committee members and our good friend Ann Harper because uh, they invited me to come speak at uh, NACE uh, Experience, right? How many of you are at NACE at the Experience in Dallas? One, two, three, four, three. Well, Ann was, so I can count her. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, oh, Leslie was there too? I was the auctioneer that night. <gasps> oh, oh, I missed that. It was an evening activity, right? I didn't Say go to- Say that again? Uh, I the didn't evening, to, yeah. I didn't get tickets to the evening stuff, so, I, and I should have, I think, was what someone told me. But anyways. Uh, congratulations for that, Leslie. So, oh, so a lot of you speak, right? How many of you speak on virtual meetings at least once this year, or once in the, uh, you know, once in the last three years? How many of you are speakers? Good. Uh, that's Christine or Kristen, right? Kristen. Yeah. Okay. So this is my number one tip for uh, for those who need to speak at any time on a virtual meeting. Uh, let me give you my number one tip. Tip is stand up, I know, it sounds easy. But even the four famous people on the last screen forgot this tip. So let me tell you, if you stand up while you're on a virtual meeting, while you're presenting, uh, you will be in the top 20% of all the speakers that I know. Uh, a friend that recently took this advice, that I told him this at an LA conference, he came back two weeks later and he called me back, or he made a meeting with me on virtual, and he said, I did two things, John, I stood up, and I purposely used hand gestures, right? There's research, it's called the Neuroscience of Virtual Selling. It's a LinkedIn class, and it says if you show your hands at least once during a virtual meeting, people are 20% more, 20 more likely to trust you and buy from you. So he did those two things, and he said it was the best interview he has done in, uh, in, eight, in his last eight interviews. So anyways, just to share the last of what I did with my corona vacation, oh, I broke a camera today, uh, is that I have a green screen that is uh, the entire space here, and then I just wanted to share, this is actually what's in front of me today. I do have a green screen camera, apparently it turned off today, but uh, behind me is a massive green screen, and then I have up to 14 screens at my disposal to do what I do. So anyways, that's a little bit about me, and I wanted to ask a question before I did anything else, uh, is to ask a little bit about you. And when I mean this last part about you, the first question I just want to open up for discussion, what is it like for you to be an API or an Asian Pacific Islander in either the events industry or you know, uh, catering, events, uh, meetings, whatever it might be? So let me share a few stories with you while you think about what the, your answer is. I was at Microsoft, and I'm sure many of you may have heard the term bamboo ceiling. And I was a fast tracker for quite a while, my first probably five or six years at Microsoft. And then it kind of hit that ceiling where I, I wasn't getting promoted anymore. And the funny part was, uh, if, if you don't know this statistic, in America, Asian Pacific Islanders have twice the national average of advanced degrees, bachelors and higher but we hold 50% or less of the executive jobs. And so this happened to me while I was at Microsoft. And so the, the, my, my boss at the time finally said that he wanted to invest in me. And at that time, I had to tell him no. 
And I said, in six months, I'll tell you why. And I said, uh, because I had already written the business plan for this company. I was already planning to leave Microsoft. So I didn't want to take, you know, his job and like take a spot for somebody else and, and have him investment in me and then me leave. So he understood, he actually appreciated six months later, but he was too late. He was too late. I got passed over multiple times at Microsoft and I said, well, I'm just going to cheat. <laughs> I'm going to start my own company. All right. I'm going to start my own company. And that, that's the, one of the few ways that had got me into the executive ranks is to start my own company. So, so that's my personal experience of being an Asian Pacific Islander in the, in the work world. That was the, that was the tech world too, Ming, right? That was back at Microsoft. By the way, there was only uh, one Asian Pacific Islander VP at the time, right? Uh, he's, uh, oh geez, I, gotta, I can see his name. I'll have to get his name. But anyways, he was in the publishing arena. Uh, there was only one out of like probably the 20 or so uh, VPs at Microsoft at the time. There's only one and there's still not that many. Although Satya now counts because <laughs> he's the CEO. Okay, so I hope that helps. So I'd love to hear some other answers from other people. If you have an answer, feel free to unmute and uh, share, share what your experience is. I'll go. Thanks, Lynn. I think when I started on the NACE board, well, side note, I'm a stationer. I do like graphic design and wedding invitations, things like that. And I think when I started on the NACE board, um, I was the only person of color. And I think everyone assumed that I was very quiet and obedient and meek and a rule follower. I've worked at a couple restaurants and someone said, you look like a brown noser. <laughs> like, I think everyone just thought I was just, you know, I'll follow instructions. I'll do anything you say. <laughs> and then people started to get to know me and I started to open up and I'm like, I'm not that way at all. And I, I just thought it was funny. I thought it was funny that that was what they assumed of me at first. And I love breaking down insinuations. So <laughs> it was great. That's my story. Lynn, I mean, that's, I grew up breaking stereotypes. I was the only honors skateboarding punk rocker when I was growing up in Stockton, California. Lynn, I'm really curious, what's a rule that you broke growing up somewhere along the line? Like anything. I w got a good example? I, just, I don't know you enough, well enough to know. A rule I broke. I mean, I wasn't even allowed to run. Like, I don't know if anyone experiences this, but if I ran and fell, my mom would yell at me while she put the Band-Aid on. <laughs> So I like she just didn't want me to get hurt, and I thought that doing sports or anything like that was bad because <laughs> I would get hurt. But she was just trying to protect me and tiger mom me. So tiger yeah. mom, tiger mom. Yeah, I'm also really bad at math, <laughs> 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 and that's kind of a rule breaker because everyone thinks I'm probably good at math. But yeah. Outstanding. Thanks, Lynn. <laughs> Who else? Uh, Michelle? What are the little things next to Lynn's name? What are those little, like, what it's are those? He gave me a fortune cookie. A fortune cookie? Yeah. Oh, it's a fortune cookie. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I was like, oh. So I here's side note, Michelle. Totally. This is called um, participation mapping or called a uh, mode uh, Emoji participation. So uh, when someone takes a moment to participate, if you have somebody, you can actually have them rename them and add an emoji. And now I can look mm -hmm. on the list and figure out who's talked and who hasn't talked very quickly. Ooh. I don't know. I've never so, seen that before. So if I wanted to you know, run a quality, right, I would go around and I would make sure and start prefacing people who haven't talked yet and at least check in with them and give them an option. Right. Oh, I love that. Go ahead, Michelle. Um, okay, so um, 
some some people might know this, but I grew up in a white family. I'm the only adopted um, child and the only Asian child, um, one of four. But so I grew up in a very, as the only Asian person, probably, you know, in the group or in the room type thing. So I'm pretty used to it now. But I feel like in the professional um, world, especially here in New Orleans, because we don't, I mean, we have a large population, like a Vietnamese population across the lake and community across the lake and things like that. But um, I'm not necessarily a part of it. So, and they're not, um, there's not a huge presence in our events community here, which of course we're trying to improve. But um, it almost, people always say like, oh, I recognize you, how do I know you? And then, you know, you do like the, the you know, you guess how many, you know, how you know each other. Cause I also went to college here and grad school here. So there could be many ways how we know each other, but um, it almost gives me like, um, people remember me more, I think, because I'm an Asian American in the in the events community or something like that, because there aren't a lot. There was one other woman who lived here temporarily and she and I semi looked alike and they would get us confused, but that other, she moved, she got a promotion in the Marriott um, family, so she moved, but um, yeah, so it, it's been a unique experience. But, um, but yeah, I also have experienced things like you said, John, at my current company, one reason, you know, there's there's three Asian Americans, no, three Asian people, period, because one one lady's Chinese, but she's um like from China. She's um, but there nobody's in leadership there in in the company. We're all managerial director level, so See. yeah, right. yeah, who's, definitely who's the in, bamboo ceiling. Who's in charge, Michelle? Um, what a white male and white females, yeah, and one black woman. She's the only one on senior leadership, yeah. That's the stats too. You have a better shot of getting into an executive position if you're a woman, black or Hispanic right now. Oh, wow. So New Orleans too has a unique culture, right too? You've heard of Yakaman? Oh yeah, I love it, yes. Does anybody know what Yakaman is? Anyone else? Uh, Michelle, can you describe it to the others? So it has like um, a long, it has like a spaghetti noodle, but it's it's a very deep colored broth, dark colored broth. And it's a very rich, it's like, um, I don't know how, you probably know more about it, John, but it's delicious. And there's one lady, Miss Linda, that is known for her yakaman here. So yakaman came about, it's like a, it's kind of like a, what we call a Blasian fusion. It's a black Asian thing. It's basically ramen, right? But it became a hangover cure, all right? It's what people ate after mm -hmm. a hangover. So it's broth, noodles, meat, veggies, and it's really famous in New Orleans. And one of my friends uh, was just asking about it. And I saw a documentary about the Yakaman lady, um, about how, you know, that's the way she's really helped New Orleans is just to keep this tradition going on. Yep. So. And she does events too. She'll come out to your event and cook. So she's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, thank you, Michelle. And again, I look forward to seeing you in, in New Orleans. I know. I... Right. The only one, like right, the only Asian in the room is kind of the feeling. Uh, again, when I was growing up in Stockton, right, we were, it was very, in the 70s, we were definitely one of the very few Asians in town. And, and it started to grow. The uh, Hmong community actually moved into Stockton because it was an agricultural basis. And so uh, they became the new immigrant. All right. <laughs> after after us, the Chinese came in. Anybody else want to share their experience of being an API in this industry? I I hope this pertains. So I I don't look Filipino, and but I I know that I am. I feel that I am, and I ex embrace the culture that has been um, given to me. But when I'm around other event professionals, especially the ones in the audience, yep. find a lot of diversity. Oh, um, it's- say the, say the last sentence again, it Leslie. Is that feeling. Cut out. No, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh no, your you, your last sentence cut out. Could you say your last sentence again? Thanks. Oh yeah, I I don't find a lot of diversity in in my field, right. and I 
I, yeah, I mean, I know that there is, but it's not, it's not something that is a big present. So it's hard to, um, it's hard to feel connected sometimes. And Leslie, where are you? I don't know. I'm in Austin, Texas. Oh, that's right. You said that. Austin, Texas as, as an auctioneer. So you're saying, for instance, in the auctioneer field that, that there are not that many Asian Pacific Islander auctioneers. Is that correct? I, I've only met um, a, a small group. And why do you so, think it is? Say again? Why do you think that is? That is a very good question, and I currently don't have a response to that. Um, it could be some of the auctioneering industry is um, can be off-putting. Now, the benefit auction, I absolutely love it. I can see more diversity in that part of the trade than I do in others. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it, it has, it probably has to do more with what is being auctioned off, like what that field is. Hmm. <clears throat> I have a, a theory, uh, maybe some others will, will chime in, but, but my theory kind Absolutely. of kind of walks around this. So how many of you have seen uh, top, I think it's called uh, Chef's Table Pizza. Has anybody seen Chef's Table Pizza on Netflix? Go watch this and go specifically watch the third episode. The third episode is a Korean chef. She goes and starts a pizza restaurant, and she's like one of the first to put kimchi on a pizza. Okay? But when she starts this restaurant, she gets disowned by her two parents going, oh my God, you're going to cook for a living, right? That's not a doctor. That's not an engineer, right? You're going to be the cook. Wait, we disown you. And auctioneering is kind of like that, like the acting field, right? Music has like, they're only now starting to make some significant inroads where there are, you know, models of people who could do that. But m most parents, right, would probably not support some of these things luckily for me i actually had a mom who did support me and now i go back and i'm like as a parent i've, I've, I've parented three kids and uh i'm not sure i would have supported myself growing up as a kid right we had uh well i was uh yeah i had uh first we got into music so he she supported me getting into violin and then guitar it was like renaissance guitar and then i went to like rock guitar and then i went to electric guitar and then i went to punk rock but she let my band of four people rehearse in her house. And it's really funny to go back that uh, all of my friends, I taught them how to play. And that all of them, they, some of them have played more than I have after, like, we have, after high school. And they've gotten to open for some of the bands that we used to really love. And uh, so anyway, so music, she did see the value in that music teaches really important skills but i'm pretty sure that like if you're if you put your parents in the tiger mom and tiger dad category uh they're probably not likely going to support you as a musician i don't know leslie does that resonate at all or not i think that makes uh that makes sense yes so thank you thank you for that Oh, thank you, Eva, too. Eva said, watch restaurants at the end of the world TV show. I have not seen that, Eva, so I will definitely check that out. So one of the things that I have done, Leslie, here, too, that I do want to share is that, uh, I, you know, I put this up here, and this is how NACE, uh, you know, AAPI Caucus and, and I came together, is that they heard that I created something. I'm one of the co-founders for API Event Profs. Uh, so in the history of Facebook, Nobody had ever thought to create a group called API Event Profs. So we did it like a year and a half ago. And right, we got six really core founding members. And that we have a collection of people that, you know, who are, are doing things. Two things that we're really doing is trying to elevate. Uh, our board now is nominating people who are Asian Pacific Islanders when award seasons come around to try and gain more recognition. And the second thing that we do is we review speaker panels. 
speaker list. Like if a conference comes out and we go through the speaker list, if there are no Asian Pacific Islanders, we'll contact the meeting organizer. And already we've been able to install two Asian Pacific Islander panels in a conference that had zero, zero representation. And one of them was here in Seattle. Seattle has like pretty high, 13 to 16% Asian Pacific Islander representation. Nationwide, it's about six and a half percent. So again, that, that's our default. Like if there's a hundred speakers, six and a half of them should be Asian Pacific Islander. And a lot of them are zero. So we're doing something, right? And, and that's the exciting part. And I'm so, yeah, thank you so much, Michelle. And, and that's why I'm excited to meet the NACE AAPI caucus, right? There's, right, I, I highly suspect that we need to collab and join. Right now, the hardest thing that we've discovered is just even the collection of people. What NACE AAPI caucus is doing right here is landmark. And it's difficult because sometimes even people who are, who identify as Asian Pacific Islander, sometimes don't identify like, I don't know if I need to join an Asian Pacific Islander group. Right? I can figure it out on my own. Right? And, and that's okay. I understand. I used to be, I, I grew up with the, my family took the path of assimilation, which meant that I tried to grow up white, right? Or in Stockton, California, and a little bit country. <laughs> I was not so good at the country part. But, <laughs> but uh, and then only in the last eight years have I really embraced my Asian Pacific Islander side and really done work in the Seattle's Asian Pacific Islander community. And I also made a crossroad into the black community here in Seattle. Like uh, I know for myself, when I go to an event and I see uh, you know, someone of color, I just really try to really acknowledge their existence. Because not everyone acknowledges mine, <laughs> right? And so that's my small part that I think I can do uh, for that. And for that, that means like I produced a number of events in the black community here and, and they have really appreciated what I've done for them. So, you know, those are the things. The second one that I just did is the National Speakers Association, of which I'm a member. Has a, 1,100 uh, people came together for a conference, and we had our first meeting of the API NSA. Because I created that Facebook group, too. <laughs> and they came up with something I thought was really cool. We're like, what do we call ourselves? Like, now that we, there was a dozen people who left, like, the keynote. And we met in the bar, and we, like, just introduced each other. And we're starting to coalesce and start to meet. And it's the first time it's ever happened in the 50-year history of that organization. And they all feel the same way too, by the way, which is like, I'm the only Asian speaker. I'm the only Asian member in this speaker association. And, uh, and they did something I thought was really cool. So uh, I know there's API and AAPI and NHPI, and I know there's a lot of controversy around there. They came up with this. I said, what do we want to call ourselves? They came up with API plus NSA. And the plus is just trying to, to acknowledge, you know, like the native Hawaiian and <clears throat> all the other uh, parts in there. But the plus also stand for the, the allies. The allies. And again, that's the other one thing that we learned in the last 18 months with this group. Is that Asian Pacific Islanders need allies almost more than any other resource group that I could think of. So I don't know if anybody has any opinions around that of like why we would need allies or not, uh, love to hear if there's anybody who has that. Yeah, Chris, Kim's Convenience on Netflix, I have watched almost the entire series. I've got like a season and a half left. Anybody else? You can either introduce yourself or you can uh, ask the question, why do we need allies? I think the only way to uplift people to be in a higher position is to have allies. Like I brought Elena on and I encouraged her to be on our board because we need people who think differently. And I know that she's from China and she works on a lot of Chinese weddings. And that's something that a lot of planners can't do so they can learn a lot from her. Elena, do you mind sharing a little bit more? Um, I think the main point for me to having an ally because um, um, since I'm new to the industry, 
I mean, I can't say I'm new anymore, but um, but you do need uh, support. So when Lean brought me in, I got to see a lot of people and I get to know what they do for uh, their job. And um, for Dallas conference, if it's not because of Lean, uh, I could never have made it. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's about support and learn more stuff from others. And can you share a little bit? You, you are from originally from China, so that may make you like first generation or? Uh, yes, uh, I'm not the first generation. I am the th third. Okay. Second. Yeah. Um, so when I came here, I basically, I learned English when I was in China for two years. Mm -hmm. And then I had one year just before I go to college, I was just learning English for a year. Um, but when I speak or talk to people or listen to people, um, <clears throat> sometimes I still have some problems just because it, it just because I, I can't learn all you know it, it sometimes it's, it's giving me troubles like when I speak and I have accent too so probably people cannot understand me so well uh, but I'm trying <laughs> um, yeah so that's my background and then I started to do this business around five years ago and it was really tough because I got to find my own market and I got to make friends. I got to make friends with vendors and wow. they're also a, well, I would say there is a little bias just compared to Asians with local planners. Um, but like, like I said, I'm growing, learning. So yeah. And uh, do you speak, do you speak Mandarin or Cantonese? Mandarin. Mandarin, yeah. I cannot understand Cantonese at all. Don't speak. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, don't say sorry to me, right? Your, your Mandarin, I'm sure, is 99% better than my <laughs> my Mandarin, right? So your your English is very good. Your English is much better than my Mandarin, for sure. So. Oh, thank you. So, Elena, let me just ask this question. Do you know what a paper sun is? Paper sun? Paper sun. No. Does anybody in the room know what a paper sun is? Okay, well, cool. So I'm going to share a little bit more because we want to talk about where we came from. So I'm a third generation Chinese. And uh, let me just share a little bit about uh, how I got here. So let's see, there we go. Okay, so I'm a paper son, right? Or my grandfather actually was the paper son. I'm actually, the, I guess, the grandson of a paper son. So let me share a little bit more about that. So I'm third generation and I'm going to share a little bit more about my grandfather. This is my grandfather. His name is Ang Ang, right? And uh, he was known as Look Low, but of course in Chinese culture you sometimes repeat a syllable as a term of endearment. So he was known to us as Ang Ang. He grew up in this village called uh, Lung Tao, right? It was, uh, it was uh, the interpretation was Dragon Head Turn. So if you look, there was a ridge of a mountain and then the river kind of turned and uh, it looked like a dragon head. Anyways, this is the village he grew up in. He was very poor. He was a farmer and uh, he grew up uh, uh, inside of this village, uh, not very wealthy. And in fact, he was also adopted. So he was adopted because his parents uh, passed away. And so his uncle raised him. So though. What happened was is that stories of something called Gum San came around, right? Gum San was uh, the land of the Golden Hills, otherwise known as the Gold Rush. And just like the dot com, like things got blown out. By the time the stories hit China, the stories were like people were picking up gold nuggets off the streets. <laughs> so people in, in China really wanted to go to America and try and, you know, make it rich. Now, but the sentiment uh, towards Asians from Americans was not really good. So if you can see this, this is an actual cover of a magazine from San Francisco, 1877, of someone protesting, right, all the workers. And so uh, they, the workers that were at the time were really mad that the Chinese were taking all the jobs, and most of the jobs were on the railroad. 
And if you don't, if you remember the history that, you know, most of the uh, Asians or Chinese took the dangerous jobs like dynamite and other types of things uh, like that. But it got so bad that uh, they were able to lobby and pass a law. It's the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And it turned thousands, right? Tens of thousands of people were immigrating in from China to work to 160. 160. And by the way, this is the first American law to discriminate against a race. It didn't count for slavery because it was a color. Right? So, so this was actually one of the first laws in America that discriminated against a race. Now, there's a loophole in the law. And the loophole in the law says if you are the son of a merchant, a business person, you are a naturalized citizen. Right? And, and so that the reason for this was that they wanted to keep the less educated, like coolie style worker out, right? But they wanted to keep business people or educated people. So what happens is, is that uh, 1906 happens. This is San Francisco. And if you remember your history books in 1906, there's a big earthquake that hits San Francisco, but that's not what screws up the town. Does anybody know what really messes up the town in the 1906 earthquake? You can chat, you can unmute. You don't know? Everything was so close to each other that it cracked the gas lines and lit the town on fire. The fire is what destroyed everything in that 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, right? Speaking of which, we have a shout out to our friends in Hawaii who are dealing with a fire right now. I'm going to share a QR code to a resource if you want to help. So uh, why is this important? It burned everything, including the courthouse. And guess what the courthouse contains? Right? Ming, you got it. Do you know what it is? It's all the records. The birth records. So they came back, and as soon as they established a new town hall, they came back in, and they said, hey, everybody right, in San Francisco, if you had some kids, will you please come back? We'll make you a new birth certificate. And every Chinese guy's like, yeah, I got four sons. I got five sons. So that's why they're called paper sons. They never existed. They were made up. And let me just go back on the, the part. I went to UC Santa Barbara, and I'm in a Asian American studies class. There are 44 of us in the class. All of us are all Asian Pacific Islander in the class. And somebody asked, right, what's the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882? I'm the only person who can friggin' answer this question. And it's only because I got a personal story in my family which always makes me wonder who the hell's writing the history books. So, so this is why I love to, to be able to share this story with you. So anyways, they come on around and um, so they, they take the, the, the birth records, they send them back to China, sell them on the black market, a birth certificate, a, fake, a book about your new family, and a third class ticket to America. And it cost about $100 per year that you are. And my, thank you, Eva. And my grandfather was 20 years old. So it cost in 1912 money, $2,000. So my, his uncle, right, who was his parent, sold a third of his farm to gamble on my, my grandfather. So he has $2,000. Now he's got this third class ticket. The third class ticket is in the steerage of the boat, the bottom of the boat. You're with the animals. If you don't die of dysentery, you have to sit in the bottom of the boat because it takes three months to get to America. And you have to study this book and start memorizing facts about your fake family. Things like you don't even know about your own house. How many windows are in your house? How many steps from the first right to the second floor? Where, uh, where does your pet like to sleep? Right? What's what uh, window does the light does uh, the light or the sun morning sun come through? So you have to memorize all these things, and then what happens is is that uh, three days before you get to uh, what's called Angel Island, this is the island. What happened is is that everyone, all the Chinese people, came out of the bottom of the boat and they would get onto the edge of this boat, and they would throw their books in the water, and they'd have to watch them float away because immigration caught wind of them. 
And if you get caught with this book, you're cheating. You would get immediately deported. So now you got to sit here and just memorize all this stuff that you, you got in. So now they come to Angel Island. So how many of you have been to San Francisco? You can just raise hand or virtual. Yeah, three of you. Okay, good. How many of you have been to Alcatraz Island? No. And how many of you have been to Angel Island? One. Oh, Ming. Good. So Ming, have you actually visited the immigration station there or not? I'm just curious. Uh, no, it was just to hike. Yeah, yeah. So the part of the hike gets halfway around the island. But next time you go, anybody who goes to, to San Francisco, take the time. It's a day trip. Go into Angel Island. And if you want to, I'll give you a cell phone game. You can actually recreate the story while walking through all the buildings that my grandfather walked through. Anyways, Angel Island was the Ellis Island of the West. It's where immigration came in, right? And so this is where they would check people. And the first thing they would do, you would come onto this dock and you were greeted by men in white lab coats and you would separate the men from the women from the children. And by the way, Elena, none of them spoke Mandarin. Right? That's your welcome. Um, that that's your welcome to America. By the way, the color white in Chinese culture it mainly is the color of a ghost. So a ghost comes in and separates you from your family and doesn't tell you why. Welcome to America. You'd get to stay in these beautiful bunks, which are three high. It's four times the legal limit for per square feet of the number of people you can have the conditions were so bad that they rioted right not only were these conditions bad the food was so bad that uh, multiple times the the people detained there rioted what you had to do then eventually is you had to wait anywhere from two weeks to six months to get this interrogation and if you failed you got deported and it would take anywhere you know again sometimes people went back and forth around these uh, parts around the testing and uh they you know again if you if you failed this test you got deported and to about out of two million people 10 percent got uh deported so two hundred thousand people got deported now of course here in asian culture right we have the concept of saving face right a lot of times people didn't want to go home and face the shame because somebody risked a lot of money on them so quite often many people went and committed suicide rather than go home and face the shame so it became a life or death game, and they don't tell you that when they buy the ticket. To give you an example of the test, here are some of the questions. Are there any lofts in your house? Are there any skylights in your house? Have you ever seen him writing letters to your father? Is she able to write? These are all the things. You've got to get all these right. There's stuff, like I said, you, you don't know. Luckily, my grandfather got through, and he only knew two English words, Sioux Sun City where there was a job waiting for him to work for the army where he got about a dollar a week and he paid back 75 cents of it in room and board. Over the course of five years, he saved 40 gold nuggets and coins. He sewed them into a coat and he risked leaving America to go back to his village in Guangzhou to get a matchmaker to find his wife, which became our grandmother, Baba. Uh, because she had a, a birth certificate and because he bought a first class ticket, he was able to bypass all the immigration he had to go through. They bought this place uh, using a, uh, a gardening business and eventually a grocery business. They were able to raise five kids and put uh, all five of them through college. Two of them are PhDs. One is a foot doctor and one uh, works at the Lawrence Livermore lab. So this is uh, the five of them now. This is my mom here in the bottom right corner. Her name is Hannah. And, uh, you know, without the bravery of my grandfather, who's a paper son, that I wouldn't be here with you today. So this piece here is, uh, is the actual certificate of my grandfather getting in. This is what you wanted out of that whole piece. This is his immigration card that said he was a United States citizen. So if anybody asks you what a paper sun is, now you know. Any questions? Any comments or questions? It looks like, uh, Lynn, what time are we at? Just to check.
I just want to make sure how much time we had. We are at 2.58. What time do we end? Three. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and just female. Okay, so can I just do one last thing here? Yeah. Okay, so two things that I wanted to do. One is uh, I wanted to just give this. We... Uh, our API event process just found a $2,000 grant for the Maui Food Bank. And we chose the Maui Food Bank because we know one of the people on the board. And she's been doing news articles and she really says there is a lot of need uh, at the Maui Food Bank. So this is a QR code or you can also look at the Maui Food Bank. If you're looking for a way to help Hawaii, uh, this is one of the, our suggested ways. Uh, she she guaranteed us that the money is going to people, uh, right? It's not going to some other place. And the last part is this, is, uh, you know, uh, just out of curiosity, right? A show of physical or virtual hands. How many felt that they gained something during this call? Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Ming. Thank you, Lynn. And, you know, the best way you could pay me back is to take the less than two minutes and... Uh, there you can either click the link and you can fill out this very, very quick survey. All you got to do is click the link or take out your phone, open up your camera, scan the QR code. You put this code in here, EVM. Uh, that's EVM and complete the survey. When you complete the survey too, you're going to get a free ticket to my engaging conference. It's three days of the secrets of how to create the most engaging conferences, summits, and masterclasses. It's going to be on October 23rd through the 25th. All right, I want to know more about what you loved about this presentation so I can do more of it. I want to know how to make it even better for you because I'm on a mission to get this message in front of as many people. I'm also super on the message. I think Lynn you know, met me and, and knows I'm really passionate about elevating a Asian Pacific Islanders in this industry and in other places. Uh, it just takes two minutes so you can scan the QR code. Just chat done when you're done and I'll leave us with one final thought before we go. I want to shout out to Eva who is on our chat line. <laughs> Thanks Eva. <laughs> And again, thanks to Ann Harper for getting me into the NACE Experience Conference. That was my first time presenting there. And I appreciated the whole experience. Thank you, Lynn. And Anne, you're the one person I can't rename because you're the host. <laughs> Here's Anne Harper's. So, hey, there's two other secrets I've seen in the chat. So you can tag people now in the chat. So if you say at sign Anne Harper. And the other one I learned is that if you think if you say semicolon, I think like smile or fortune cookie or anything like that, you can get the emoji for it. So at, I used to use at signs, but it wouldn't correctly tag people, but now it correctly tags people. Thank you, Ming. All right, I'll leave us with this uh, final message for those who are just finishing up. Thanks, Michelle. I think the one thing that, that I've uh, talked to, too, in these Asian Pacific Islander groups, right? the number one is do something. This is what I love about all you're doing, right? The fact that you spent you know, a portion of your day here, keep doing that. Keep gathering. Try and get other people. I think the number one thing that we got to do is gather right now. We have the potential to be the largest affinity group. We have 50 cultures. 
if we could just get all of us in one place. So that's my, my one piece is really try and figure out how can we do something and gather people. And, uh, and then the second piece is why we need allies. I was working as the producer for a conference and my Jew, my white Jewish female ally, Joan Eisenstadt, who's a, who's a legend in the industry, came back and she goes, John, your conference doesn't have any Asian Pacific Islander speakers. I was like, shit, I missed it. I missed it. I was working on this conference and I missed it. And that brought to light to me, why do Asian Pacific Islanders need allies? We spend the majority of our lifetime, right, trying to push stuff away or, or kind of ignore it, right? And, and so I think we need allies to spot our blind spots. And so, you know, the second thing to do is recruit allies, right? Ann Harper, you're one of our allies. Thank you. Right? The fact that you, again, let me into the conference, that's a huge thank you. And I hope I was able to reciprocate, you know, that. <laughs> oh, hearts from Ann Harper. And so things like that. We need allies. And so that's the second message I give to you. I hope that rings true with you. It has certainly ring true with me the more I look into it uh, when even I can't see my own blind spots. So I hope all of you have enjoyed this time here at NACE AAPI Caucus. I hope you learned something and I hope to see you again because I'll be back. Uh, back to you, Lynn. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We're always looking for speakers for our next monthly meeting. So if you have any, um, anyone you know, any allies, anything that would help us learn about everyone's journey. That that was a really great story, John. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like my my father never mentions his story. Oh, ask. ask. Well, he well he died, but. <laughs> Oh, get somebody else to tell you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm not sure why, but all my mom says is like he had a hard time. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, Lynn and I were talking about this pre-show and we're just talking about like um, the challenges that we have. You know, again, my mom passed away in, in 2018. I'm going to give you something for those who are still here. Uh, I want to just give you this gift. So one of the pieces was uh, I did the video for my mom's memorial, right? Her celebration of life. And it's composed of over 250s and video, uh, photos and videos. But what's most important, Lynn, is that I accidentally did a drone video with her and I started asking questions. And if you don't know a drone, the phone and the controller is the microphone. So while the drone was flying way out there, I was sitting right next to my mom who was in a wheelchair and she started giving me all these childhood stories. And so now I can actually, in the video, you will hear my mom's voice. And if you watch a lot of memorials, right, you will rarely hear the voice of the person who had passed. And it's really, really made the video that much more impactful. So if you want to learn a little bit more about where I came, uh, check out my mom's video that's in the, it's in the videos in the link, links in the video. So, okay, Lynn? Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Have a great week. Hope to see you next month. I'll leave you with Lynn's favorite song. It's Shut Down from the band that she saw, Blackpink. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, John.